Jesus was upsetting the proverbial apple cart with his preaching. His message could threaten national security and stability. As long as Jesus stayed in Galilee, he was under the auspices of King Herod Antipas, the puppet king of Rome, and the threat of Roman subjugation was minimal. But Judea is a different story. The political turmoil and violence caused by the zealots forced Rome to put this portion of Herod's kingdom under the authority of a Roman governor. Should Jesus incite the people of Judea, riots could occur, and the streets of Jerusalem could run red with the blood of innocent, foolish people. Rome made it clear that it was the responsibility of the Sanhedrin to maintain peace in the streets of Jerusalem. What would these sanctimonious religious leaders do with Jesus? The common people believed Jesus was the Messiah, while the religious educated knew better because Jesus did not subscribe to their traditions and rituals. Should Jesus not submit to the ritual authority of the tradition of the elders, then he must die. The leaves are showing signs of change. The air is starting to cool. No doubt fall is approaching. And with the coming of fall, the annual Feast of Tabernacles pilgrimage to Jerusalem will occur. It is early September of 32 AD. The quiet interlude Jesus enjoyed with his disciples is coming to an end. For the past 18 to 20 months, the ministry of Jesus centered on the cities of Galilee, with only occasional trips to Jerusalem during the various annual feast days. John chapter 7 verse 1 clearly indicates why Jesus stayed in Galilee away from Judea for these many months. After this, Jesus went around Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. Jesus tarried in Galilee because of the secret plot of the Pharisees to kill him should his ministry be extended to Judea and Jerusalem for any length of time. When the Feast of Tabernacles of 32 AD drew near, the paternal brothers of Jesus challenged his messianic ministry by stating, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Christ's own brothers challenged Jesus to go to Judea to present himself to his disciples. But this is not their real motive. Christ's brothers wanted Jesus to present his messianic ministry to the Sanhedrin for their religious stamp of approval. The reason for their challenge is made clear by verse 5. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Christ's own paternal brothers did not believe that he was the Messiah. No doubt the unbelief that characterized Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus, permeated his own household and family. Is it possible that Jesus came from a dysfunctional family? All three synoptic gospels record an event that on the surface seems harsh and rude. The scene is this. Jesus is preaching to a crowd when his mother and brothers approach the outer reaches of the crowd. Because of the largeness of the crowd, Jesus' mother and brothers could not reach him. Therefore the crowd sent word to him that his mother waited for him outside. Who can forget the rude rebuke of Jesus to his own loving mother and his brothers? Mark chapter 3, verse 33 through 35. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother.
Why would Jesus say such a thing to his mother? When we harmonize these events in the three Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, the answer becomes clear. When we read the context of this incident in the Gospel of Mark, we see that the family of Jesus, including his mother, came to Jesus to take charge of him because they believed he was out of his mind. Mark chapter 3, verse 20 through 21. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. Some of the people in the crowd also believed that Jesus was possessed by an evil spirit. Therefore his family was sent to take control of Jesus. Mark chapter 3 verse 30 to 31. He said this because they were saying, He has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. Now we have the reason why Jesus rebuked his mother and brothers. Mary, the mother of Jesus, whom for centuries has been venerated and at times worshipped, may not be as perfect as Catholic dogma might indicate. Mary, the mother of Jesus, joined her other sons to take control of Jesus because they believed he was insane. Dysfunctional? I think so. But let's not be too hard on the brothers of Jesus. Consider the difficulty and social pressure created by Jesus in their own hometown of Nazareth. The brothers of Jesus just wanted a normal life, but all they got was social antagonism. It probably wasn't safe for Mary and her sons to go even to their own local synagogue for worship and fellowship. Jesus understood family dynamics because his own brothers were in opposition to him. When Jesus preached that he came to bring family division, he understood because his own family was divided against him. Now we should understand why Jesus warned his disciples that their greatest obstacles in their faith would be members of their own families. Jesus responded to the challenge of his brothers by stating, The right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. You, go to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, because for me the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. Jesus responded to the challenge by informing his brothers that the time for his presentation to the Sanhedrin as the Passover sacrifice had not yet come. But any time was suitable for his brothers to seek public display because they identified with the Pharisaic tradition. Jesus rebuked his brothers for their attitude by stating that their hunger for acceptance by the Jewish religious system was his proof of their submission to it. The mission of Jesus was to expose the evil in the world and to a Jew that world was Jerusalem. The brothers of Jesus sought to do the will of Jerusalem, while Jesus sought to do the will of his Father. Where you place your obedience, there your loyalty will lie also. Jesus determined that he would not go to the feast, but instructed his brothers to journey to Jerusalem without him. After his brothers left for the feast, Jesus changed his mind and also left for Jerusalem. He went also, not publicly, but in secret. What happened to change the mind of Jesus? We read in the Gospel of Luke, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. No doubt, the Holy Spirit revealed to Jesus 
that the time for his paschal sacrifice was drawing near. Jesus knew now that the Galilean ministry was over. Therefore he set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing that Judea would see his final days. The journey to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles marked an important turning point in the life and ministry of Jesus, because he would face the opposition of the religious leaders that would culminate in his death and resurrection. The Bible indicates that when the feast arrived, the Sanhedrin sought Jesus. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, Where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He is a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. The Sanhedrin sought Jesus for two possible reasons. The first reason they sought Jesus was to secretly arrest and execute him because of his rejection of their traditions and his declaration that God is his father. Jesus made himself equal with God and this would not be tolerated. The second reason is more pragmatic. The Jews sought to control the controversy Christ created by his continual presence at the annual feasts. The nation was divided concerning Jesus. Some perceived Christ as a good man, while others reasoned that Christ was a deceiver. Jesus' ministry challenged the spiritual foundation of the nation. Those who trusted God came to him, while those who trusted Moses rejected Jesus. But in the end, no public acknowledgement came because the populace feared Sanhedrin excommunication. Nearly halfway through the eight-day feast celebration, Jesus went to the temple and taught the masses the word of God. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? According to verse 15, the people marveled at his expositions, especially since he had not been trained in the rabbinic schools. Jesus responded to the challenge of the Jews, stating that his doctrine did not originate from intellectual pursuits of the human soul, but his doctrine was received by divine revelation. Christ defended the source of his doctrine by providing the following evidence. My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Jesus stated that those who truly desire to be the servants of the Lord will be able to discern the spiritual source of his doctrine. The Holy Spirit can only reveal truth to those who seek truth from the mouth of God. Christ also taught that those who seek to preach their own doctrine also seek their own glory through the praise of men, not the praise of God. Jesus now exposes the plot of the Sanhedrin. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all astonished. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearance 
and make a righteous judgment. Jesus openly acknowledged the plot of the Sanhedrin to kill him. And he rebuked his hearers for their hypocrisy in not keeping the law concerning murder. The public, being ignorant of the plot of the Sanhedrin, accused Christ of being paranoid because they did not believe their own pastors would seek to kill Jesus. At this point, Jesus exposed the cancer that seethed in the heart of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. The issue was the violation of Sabbath ritual at the Feast of Tabernacles the previous year with the miracle that violated Pharisee tradition. Christ rebuked the Pharisees for judging according to external appearance and not judging the righteous judgment of the Lord. The Pharisees were concerned with adherence to their legalistic traditions concerning the Sabbath day and not with the restoration of one of God's children on his holy day. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. At least some of the people of Jerusalem realized that Jesus was the one whom the Sanhedrin sought to kill. Apparently, the plot of the Pharisees was common knowledge among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, while those who attended the feast from surrounding provinces were ignorant of the plot. The crowd debated the messianic ministry of Jesus because of the authority of his teachings. They reasoned that maybe Jesus was the Messiah because the religious leaders did not openly challenge the ministry of Jesus. According to Pharisee theology, the Messiah would supernaturally appear from heaven to the nation of Israel as a political king to establish a political kingdom. Therefore, according to Jewish thought, the Messiah would have an unknown genealogy. This doctrine was an error because the prophets clearly reveal the Messiah's genealogy, birthplace, ministry, and character. It would seem that the Pharisees established their theology on the scriptures that dealt solely with the Messiah's kingly manifestation and failed to study the entire volume of scripture concerning the Messiah. Jesus defended his position by stating, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one would lay a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? Again, Jesus clearly indicates that God is his Father. Therefore, he was of divine origin. He cannot be the Messiah because we know the parentage of Jesus. Is it possible that Jesus could trace his ancestry to the throne of David to strengthen his claim? This question must be answered. The rebuke of Jesus angered the Jews to the point that they sought to arrest him for blasphemy, but the time was not right. The Jews rejected Jesus for two reasons. First, the Jews were ignorant of the full volume of Scripture concerning the Messiah. Their knowledge of God and the Bible was restricted to their theology. The second reason is that the Jews were also ignorant of the full history of Jesus because they judged Christ by his Galilean accent and home. The nation was splitting down the middle concerning Christ. Multitudes rejected Jesus because he challenged the established religious system. But multitudes also acknowledged their faith in Jesus as Messiah because of the miracles he performed to confirm his ministry and person. In the wake of the controversy, 
The Pharisees' rejection of Christ entered into open hostility, and they sent guards of the Sanhedrin to arrest him. The Sanhedrin rejected Jesus for three reasons. The first reason is simple. The Sanhedrin sought to arrest Christ because they reasoned that he was a deceiver of the people. Simply stated, his person, teachings, and ministry did not conform to the theology of the Pharisees concerning the Messiah. The second reason is a little more subtle. The Sanhedrin sought to arrest Christ because the truth was setting multitudes free from the religious control of the traditions of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were losing their religious influence to manipulate the illiterate masses. The third reason is the most pragmatic. The Sanhedrin sought to arrest Christ because his ministry created tremendous unrest in the nation, pitting brother against brother, and they feared Roman military intervention. The Sanhedrin was losing control of the people. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. To understand this declaration, we must delve into the scriptural and historical significance of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Torah instituted three annual feast pilgrimages to Jerusalem and the Temple. These feasts are the Passover that occurs in early spring, Pentecost that occurs in late May or early June, and Tabernacles that occurs in mid to late September or early October. This feast was instituted by the Law of Moses to commemorate God's divine provision of water and their temporary dwellings during the wilderness wandering. The feast was designed to remind the children of Israel that they were pilgrims on this planet, dwelling in temporary shelters, waiting for their promised possession in the kingdom of the Messiah. The feast was to strengthen their faith in the divine provision during their earthly wanderings until Messiah comes. The feast was seven to eight days in duration, with the participants joining at the temple in Jerusalem. During the eight days celebration, often the Jews would construct temporary tents out of palm branches to commemorate the temporary structures of the wilderness wanderings and to meditate on their promise of the Messianic kingdom. Each day during the feast, after the morning sacrifice, the officiating priest would lead the people to the fountain of Siloam. The priest would fill a golden pitcher and bring it back to the temple amid music and joyful shouts. At this point in the celebration, the priest would advance to the altar of burnt offering, and at the cry of the people, lift up thy hand, the priest emptied the pitcher toward the west and toward the east a cup of wine while the people chanted, with joy shall we draw waters out of the wells of salvation. In the midst of this pomp and ceremony, Christ, on the last day, the greatest day of the feast, made this spiritual offer in a loud voice. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Imagine the disturbance this declaration created. The Jews perceived the Feast of Tabernacles only from a historical position. They sought to commemorate the provision of physical water to quench the thirst of the physical man. But Jesus sought to relieve the spiritual thirst of the Jews. By this declaration, Jesus made himself equal with God. Then he also said, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. The necessary qualification to drinking living water 
is to believe in Jesus. Biblical belief on Christ is not established on intellectual agreement with the doctrines of Jesus, but on faith, trust, and reliance on His person. The promise is sure. Those who believe will be transformed into channels of living water to a thirsty world. The thing that angered the Jews was Jesus offering Himself as the Lord, the fountain of living water, the well of salvation. Jesus was offering Himself as the spiritual fulfillment of their ceremony of taking water from the fountain of Siloam. In verse 39, John interpreted the spiritual application of the symbol, living water, as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would be given to all believers when Christ is glorified. The reaction of the people was mixed. Several concluded Jesus must be the prophet spoken of by Moses, or maybe the Messiah, while others reasoned Jesus to be a deceiver. After Jesus' discourse, during the Feast of Tabernacles, the temple guards attempted to arrest Jesus, but returned to the Sanhedrin without him, awed by his authoritative teachings. The Pharisees rebuked the guards for being deceived by Jesus also, since none of the rulers and the Pharisees openly confessed Christ. But secretly, many of the chief rulers did believe in Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 42 to 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. In the eyes of the self-righteous Pharisees, the illiterate masses were cursed for their lack of knowledge concerning the law of Moses. According to rabbinic writings from the time period of Jesus, the common attitude of the Pharisees concerning the unlearned was that they were vermin, people of the earth, and the daughters of the Pharisees were to marry only a Pharisee. A common statement of the Pharisees concerning the ignorant was, the ignorant is impious, only the learned shall have part in the resurrection. It would appear the educated Jews rejected Christ, while the uneducated Jews received Christ. Nicodemus rebuked the Sanhedrin because they judged Christ contrary to the law of Moses. The Sanhedrin was as disobedient to the law as the publican or the sinner. The only difference was the leaders robed their disobedience and sin in theology and religion. To defend against the charge of Nicodemus, the Pharisees resorted to the fact that Jesus came from Galilee and no biblical prophet came from the region of Galilee. The Pharisees of Judea had a sectarian hatred of Galilee because the Galileans could not come to their celebrations and study in the rabbinic schools. As good as the Pharisees were in their own theology, they did not know their own history, because Galilee was the birthplace of the prophets Jonah and Nahum the Elkoshite. The Feast of Tabernacles ended, but the boxing match still raged. The bell rang, and each boxer went to his own corner. The members of the Sanhedrin went home, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Why did the Pharisees and Jesus have such conflict? This question could be answered in many different ways, but one root reason does come to mind. Jesus did not accept much of their theological debate. Jesus cut through their traditions to the heart of the Torah. Jesus would have been heralded as a great Messiah should he only have preached and practiced the rituals and traditions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Doctrine was the stumbling block that caused conflict between Jesus and the Sanhedrin. Each Christian denomination 
has their own doctrinal issues included in their constitution and bylaws. And each congregational member is expected to agree with this theological position. Denominational doctrine is not wrong, but our theological position should not govern our acceptance of brothers and sisters in Christ who are not part of our denomination. Political correctness preaches the importance of ethnic tolerance, but Christians must take this concept one step further and preach denominational tolerance. Do we elevate our doctrines over the person of Jesus Christ? Do we center our Christian walk more on theological debate than on true relationship with Jesus? Do we study the Bible to discover truth, or do we use the Bible only to prove our theology? How we honestly answer these questions will help us discover the depth of our relationship with Jesus.